Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to get started, and I'm sure you would too. Thank you all for coming out. Good morning to each of you. Welcome to today's informational meeting convened by the House Children and Youth Committee. I'm State Representative Katherine Watson from one of the best districts in Bucks County. Well, actually the best. Um, I don't have colleagues here, I get to say that. And uh, it's my privilege, very seriously, to serve as chairwoman of this committee, along with, from Center County, Representative Conklin, uh, who serves as the co-chair. Before we begin, though, I would like to remind you, if you would please turn off your cell phones. I refer to it as putting them on stun. You do whatever you do, but just so they don't ring uh, during our presentation today. I would note for those who have the opportunity and are watching on PCN, you will, I, as the camera might go around and you're going, well, you know, why isn't everybody here? You need to understand, and for those of you in the audience who weren't aware, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting was scheduled on a normal session day. But as want in Harrisburg, people decide far above my level, uh, and even that of uh, our Vice Chair Representative Mal above your level, they decide that we're not going to be in today. It's a token day. Well, then some members scheduled things to do, but we have a guest all the way from California. And when you can get somebody to come in and talk to us from f an expert and that far away, I'm not canceling. Were you going to cancel? Not at all. So, <laughs> so it's a, we try in a humorous way to say to you, we are delighted those of you who could make it are here. We have some folks who are here from the Human Services Committee because this topic really crisscrosses several of our committees and our endeavors. Um, we had asked the Judiciary Committee, I don't think they have anybody here, but they were invited because we know, once again, we were just discussing. We get to the point of legislation, it'll be a discussion of where does that go and does it end up in Judiciary? And But we still have at least one or two lawyers in the room as I look around. So we're in good shape no matter what happens. But before we do that, for the ha uh, House uh, Children and Youth Committee, uh, Jeannie, would you please take attendance? And then I would like to ask everyone just to, if you take a moment, introduce yourself because we do have people from other committees here. Thank you. Here. Thank you, Jeannie. Now, if we would, starting at this end, can we begin and just reintroduce yourself in some cases, you already said here, but if you would state your name and just tell us the county you're from, I'd like people to realize we do have a good representation of the Commonwealth, the breadth of the Commonwealth, the north to the south. We're in good shape. Uh, my name is Jack Rader. Uh, I'm a member of the Children's Youth Committee, and I'm from Monroe County, northeastern Pennsylvania, 176th District. Uh, Greg Rothman uh, from Cumberland County, the 87th District, and a member of the committee. Good morning, everyone. I'm Representative Dan Mal uh, from Adams County, home of Gettysburg, where America was saved. I guess it's me. I've talked too much. Uh, it is Representative Kathy Watson from the 144th District. I've already explained to you it's the best one in Bucks County. And I have the very distinct privilege of having been chairman of the House Children and Youth Committee for a number of years. 
Scott Conklin, the 77th District, Western Center County, home of Penn State University. Judy Smith from the Human Services Committee. Melanie Brown, Human Services Committee. Uh, Representative Brian Sims, Center City, Philadelphia, where uh, America was born. <laughs> uh, Representative Mike Driscoll from Northeast Philadelphia. Representative Vanessa Lowry Brown from Philadelphia. Good morning. Pam Delicia, the 194th, which are parts of Montgomery and Philadelphia counties. Thank you, members. And it may indeed, audience, you may see some members coming in from other meetings also that stayed scheduled regardless of whether we were in session or not, but I did have a couple of yeses from people who may arrive late. But let us go to why we are all here. Our focus today is on the attachment-related family pathology known as parental alienation syndrome. The syndrome is defined as the psychological manipulation of a child by one parent in order to alienate the child from the other parent. And sadly and typically, this occurs often during and following a divorce. And I know you are sitting there thinking, you've heard a story about somebody or it happened to your sister and brother-in-law or whatever it might be. But indeed, and our expert's gonna tell us, it is indeed a real syndrome there is a pathology to it. We need to understand it before we might even be able to begin to address it. And as I've said, the committee's fortunate then to have with us today Dr. Uh, Craig Childress, a psychologist from California, who is a renowned expert on parental alienation syndrome. Dr. Childress will brief the committee on this syndrome and its effects on children, which many consider to be tantamount to, uh, tantamount rather, to child abuse. Also severely affected, as you would expect, is the parent who's been alienated in this process and effectively erased from his or her children's lives. Doctor, we welcome you. We certainly appreciate your willingness to travel across the country. Some of us have trouble coming two hours, you know, from uh, to get to Harrisburg. So we appreciate what you have done, and uh, because you know this is important, and we wish to be educated. So if you would please come up and sit there, and you will have the floor. Um, we hope, ladies and gentlemen, there will be some time for members to ask questions and uh, further discuss this very uh, un um, yeah. unpleasant, but it is a very important topic. And I think, sir, it's a topic we really don't quite understand. Uh, and indeed, some would say, oh, it's not that bad. So we look forward to this. Thank you. Yes, I, that is correct. I, my executive director reminded me, doctor, we have some copies of your book. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, that we would be happy to share with our members. All right, called Foundations. Right. And I assume you'll be referring to things in there. Mm -hmm. And please, doctor, pl uh, begin your presentation when you are ready. We are okay. eager to listen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you to all the members of the committee and everyone who's, who's here today for the invitation to speak to you. Um, I am tremendously honored to be able to speak to you today and to represent the parents who are suffering tremendously um, from this type of pathology. That what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start by describing the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and it's pretty horrific. Then I will talk a little bit about the pathology and I might get a little technical at that point but it's it's important to understand this is not a new form of pathology that's unique in all of mental health. This is standard and established stuff. It has to do with attachment pathology and personality disorder pathology and family systems pathology. And once we return to the path of established psychological constructs and principles, we can absolutely solve this. The problem is we got off track. We got into the wilderness of new forms of pathology 
and that's derailed our ability to solve this, creating a lot of high conflict divorce, clogging our court systems, and destroying families. And so I'm going to describe a little bit about the pathology, and then I'm going to move from the pathology into the solution. What do we do about this? And we can absolutely solve this once we understand what the pathology is and once we um, get the proper professional expertise to assess, diagnose, and treat the pathology. So again, thank you for the invitation. I have a handout that's in your, your booklets there. And if you could turn to the last page for a second, you'll see a picture of this little girl at a soccer field between her mommy and daddy and her stepmom and stepdad. That's a healthy separated family structure. That's what divorce or post-divorce family is supposed to look like. And the, now, when you look at this, you can see how fragile that little child is between her mommy and daddy. Because if there's a lot of anger and hostility between mom and dad, guess where it's going through? It's going through her. And it, gets, it destroys children when there is a good deal of hostility and anger in the family. The issue that we're facing, primarily, is that one of the parents in this family is a narcissistic personality or a borderline personality. There's about five to six percent of the population are narcissistic personalities, about five to six percent are borderline personalities. So that makes about 10 percent of the divorces will involve a narcissistic or borderline personality. They are excessively high conflict. And a lot of times people say, oh, it's both parents. No, no, no. When you got a narcissistic or borderline parent, it only takes one. And that parent creates this intense conflict that moves through the child and destroys the family. And right now, what we have in this situation is that nobody is doing anything to stop it. Professional psychology is not doing anything to stop it. The legal system is not doing anything to stop it. That children are losing a relationship with a normal range and loving parent. Parents are losing a relationship with their children, oftentimes for the rest of their lives. A normal loving parent is losing their child and we are leaving children with a significantly pathological, narcissistic, or borderline parent. And no one is doing anything to stop it. Now this is not my field. High conflict divorce is not where I come from. Um, I actually come out of ADHD and early childhood mental health. And I was a clinical director of an early childhood assessment and treatment center and entered private practice about 2008. And that's when I ran into my first case of parental alienation. <coughs> And back in 2008, I had never heard the word parental alienation because no sane mental health professional goes into high conflict divorce. Because high conflict divorce, it's too risky professionally. You're likely to get licensing board complaints from these angry, narcissistic, borderline parents. Uh, if you make a misstep with the legal system, that could be uh, you could lose your license or get in trouble with the licensing board or the legal system interface. And therapy isn't particularly helpful because you've got these parents who are conflict and so there's no rewards out of doing therapy. So mental health professionals go into other domains, ADHD, autism, trauma, you know, eating disorder, anything. But mental health professionals do not go into high conflict divorce. And what that creates is a situation that the ones who go into high conflict divorce, the only motivation to do that is because it's very lucrative. Child custody evaluations are twenty to forty thousand dollars per evaluation, and they let me tell you, they are significantly problematic. Um, then therapy, this there's some reunification therapy, they call it. There's no such thing as reunification therapy, not in any model, not any theorist, no such thing as reunification therapy. But people say they do it, and it goes on for years. So it's a nice 
lucrative way. You have your, your slot in your schedule filled, and it's paid private pay because insurance won't pay for it, but it's court ordered. And so you just, for five, three, four years, you do therapy and nothing changes. So it's a very lucrative for mental health professionals, but not very rewarding and nothing gets solved. So when I first ran into parental alienation, this issue, back in about 2008, I started to look into this one particular family I was working with and looked at the failure of the legal system and the failure of the mental health system surrounding this, and I was appalled absolutely appalled by the absence of professional knowledge and the absence of professional competence. I was so appalled that I shifted my career out of ADHD in early childhood, hopefully I'll have a chance to get back to that at some point, because this needs to stop. Families are being destroyed. These children are losing loving relationships with loving parents and we're leaving children with the pathology of a significantly um, psycho psychopathology uh, parent, narcissistic borderline parent. So then I set about, back in about 2008 till now, to um, create the solution, to develop the solution within professional psychology. And that solution is to return us to standard and established professional uh, practice. Now on the first page of the handout, I have some uh, discussion of Gardnerian parental alienation syndrome. And with, with all due respect to the chairwoman, um, the problem is the syndrome idea. Back in the mid 80s, the psychiatrist Richard Gardner proposed this entirely new form of pathology, which he called parental alienation syndrome, that was unique in all of mental health, requiring this set of eight diagnostic indicators that he just made up out of thin air. Now, there was some support for what he's seeing, but he made up, he, he didn't do, he skipped the step of diagnosis. Diagnosis is the application of standard and established constructs and principles to a set of symptoms. Instead, he proposed this new form of pathology called parental alienation. And in doing that, he led everyone off of the path of professional psychology. And immediately, establishment psychology um, challenged Gardner and said, look, there's no scientific evidence for a new form of pathology in mental health. And it divided professional psychology into the schism of advocates for parental alienation and detractors of parental alienation. And you, we will still see this division within professional psychology. There's no such thing as parental alienation. Well, yes, there is. For the most part, both sides are right. Both sides are correct. The Gardner's model of parental alienation syndrome went back in 2008 when I started to look at this and I looked at Gardner's model. It's horrible. It's really, really bad. I understand why the people who are critical of that are so critical of it. It's not a good model of pathology. And this is not a unique new form of pathology. He skipped diagnosis. At the same time, Gardner was correct. There is a pathology here. This is a narcissistic borderline parent who is twisting up the family and twisting up the, the child. So he was right in that respect, he just didn't do a very good job of diagnosing it. So then what I set about to do, recognizing that problem, the, the second problem that emerges from this is that the legal system is not designed to do family therapy. It's designed for different functions. It's designed to follow the law, not figure out where the pathology is in the family or, or litigate between whether the child should take soccer or music lessons. That's not the role of the court system. And so the court system needs to rely on professional psychology and the expertise in professional psychology. But the moment we wander off into new forms of pathology, we undercut the expertise that we are providing to the court system and that the court system needs. And that prevents the court system from responding appropriately to this type of psychopathology. So recognizing that back in 2008, 2009, I set about developing or um, developing the diagnosis, returning to the step that Gardner skipped. What is this pathology that we're looking at? 
And fundamentally, if we have a child rejecting a parent, that's an attachment-related pathology. The attachment system is the brain system for love and bonding, um, governs love and bonding throughout the lifespan, including grief and loss. A child rejecting a parent is, a, is an attachment pathology. So from that, from just that place to begin with, the attachment system is a predator-driven system developed over millions of years of evolution to protect children from predators. The attachment system never spontaneously dysfunctions. It only dysfunctions in response to what we call pathogenic parenting. Parenting practices that are producing pathology in the child. So if I have an attachment pathology in a child, a child rejecting a parent, that's as bizarre as a parent rejecting a child. Oh, I don't like, you're annoying about your homework, I'm going to put you in foster care. No, that never happens. That's, that's really bizarre for a child to reject a parent because there's a predator who's more than happy to eat the child. In fact, bad parents actually more strongly motivate the child because a bad parent exposes a child to the, parent, the predator, so the child is more strongly motivated to bond to the bad parent. That's called an insecure attachment. And so I have an attachment pathology in the child. I know it's being caused by one or the other parent. If it's by the rejected parent, then we're looking at child abuse. We're looking at some sort of physical abuse or sexual abuse or something really bad that that parent's doing that's causing that child to reject the parent. Um, that parent is more damaging to the child than the predator would be. Or it's being caused by this allied and supposedly favored parent. And what that pathology is, is it has to do with, it's out of family systems, um, therapy, it has to do with what's called a cross-generational coalition of the parent with the child against the other parent. And so they formed a coalition against the other parent. And so I know one or the other parent is causing this child's pathology. It's just a matter of determining which one. So let me talk a little bit about families right now and what's happening in the families. Um, there are four basic models of psychology, um, psychoanalytic, uh, cognitive behavioral, humanistic, existential, and family systems. Family systems therapy is the only one that deals with families, all the other individual-based models. So when we're talking about families, we should be over in the family systems literature. And up on, I think, the third page there, there's a little diagram of a healthy transition of a family, post-divorce transition of a family. Families go through a lot of transitions over the course. First one has to do with uniting the couple into a marital unit. Now, if they divorce at that point, before there's a birth of a child, they go back to being individuals. But the moment there's a child born, that's now a family. And divorce does not end the family. The family will always be there once you have a child. Divorce ends the marriage, not the family. And what happens is we go from the intact family structure that was united by the marriage to now a post-divorce separated family structure where the parents are living apart, but that's now united by that child. It's the child holding the family together because of the shared bonds with both parents. And that's that little girl in the soccer uniform. She's holding this family together. But that puts the child in a very vulnerable position that it, if there's nasty conflict stuff going through, that's going to rip the child apart. And so that's, as you move down into the, the third picture there, we get what's called a cutoff family structure, where the child, because there's a conflict between the parents, the child is either in the middle of the conflict and they can't stay there for too long, a year, a year, and then boom, they, they choose one side or the other in this to get out of the middle of the conflict. And so you get that cutoff family con uh, conflict. Cutoff family structure is described by Murray Bowen. He's one of the top people in family systems work. The cross-generational coalition is described by Salvador Mnuch and Jay Haley. These are top-notch experts in family system stuff. This is not new forms of pathology. We know exactly what's going on. So we get this cutoff family structure here and if you look at that third picture, that's not divorce, that's the death of a parent. A cutoff family, that mother in that third picture is essentially dead. 
The healthy divorce is that first picture. It's a separated family structure that's united by the child and by the shared love of the child for both parents and from both parents. Another important thing to recognize in that shared love, a lot of people will say a child has the right to love both parents, and that's absolutely true. The child has the right to love both parents. In addition, the child has the right to receive the love of both parents. That's incredibly important for child development, to get the love of both parents. There are four types of parent-child relationship. Uh, Mother-son, mother-daughter, father-son, father-daughter. All of those relationships are magnificent and important and none of them are expendable. The mother-son relationship is likely to be the most affectionate. There's a lot of affectionate bonding going on there. And the son is going to use that mother template for his wife. The mother-daughter relationship is perhaps one of the most complex and is, uh, that daughter is going to get a lot of gender-related self-esteem and self-identity from that mother-daughter relationship and she's also going to use that as a template for raising her own children when she becomes a mother. The father-son relationship gives a lot of the male kind of uh, self-identity and self-esteem issues that go forward for this and helps a young man become a responsible and mature young man. The father-daughter relationship, I've got a daughter, again, one of the most affectionate ones. That's daddy's princess and she's going to use that as a template for her husband and how to solve things or how to um, choose a husband and work with a husband in her own relationship. All of those relationships are important. All, none of them are expendable. That third picture where we lose a parent, no, that is not healthy for the child. And we must make sure that all post-divorce families have that first picture, that all first post-divorce families have that healthy separated family structure. We don't have a choice because it's in the child's best interest. We must accomplish that. The issue as we move to the following page with John Bowlby on attachment theory. The moment we move back to understanding this is an attachment related pathology, John Bowlby, the king kahuna of attachment back in the 60s and 70s, he first described the attachment pathology, says in that second slide, the deactivation of attachment behavior is a key feature of certain common variants of pathological mourning. It's, it's the inability to process sadness in the family. And, what, and then the following quote links, um, or the, down at the final one, that disturbances in personality uh, create disordered mourning. We turn to the personality disorder uh, people and the um, Otto Kernberg describes how the narcissistic parent is unable to process sadness and grief and instead translates it into anger and resentment loaded with revengeful wishes. That the narcissistic and borderline personality cannot process sadness. And so when the divorce takes place, that narcissistic borderline parent, instead of processing the sadness around the divorce, turns it into anger towards the other spouse. And the, the narcissist is vulnerable to rejection. The borderline is vulnerable to abandonment. And so there's a slight difference in how they will express it. The narcissist, oftentimes, you will find a narcissistic husband, a narcissistic male. It tends to be more prevalent in males. And it has a domestic violence feel to it. And oftentimes you will have this, this narcissistic husband has been kind of berating and demeaning to his wife for kind of years. Finally, she can't tolerate it anymore. She divorces him. And he says, how dare you divorce me? How dare you have the temerity to reject my magnificence? You'll be sorry you divorced me. I'm going to take what you most love in your world, your children, and I'm going to kill them for you. I'm going to take their love and destroy their love that you have with your children. You'll be sorry you divorced me. Whoa. Whoa. And people are letting him do that. Therapists are letting him do that. The court is letting him do that. And this mom is losing her kid for the years, decades, maybe the rest of her life because of this narcissistic desire to get revenge on her because she had the temerity of divorcing him. The borderline mom 
is uh, borderline personality is often associated with sex abuse. So there's a potential that she's been sexually abused as a kid. And so when the divorce happens, and she's afraid of abandonment. She's being abandoned by her ex. So what now, one of the ways she manages her ab abandonment fears is I've got the children. You can't abandon me because I've got what you want. I've got the children. And as long as the children love me, I'm not the abandoned one. They're abandoning you. You're the one who's being abandoned, not me. I'm the wonderful parent who never is, is going to be abandoned. But in addition, when the children go over to spend time with their dad, her abandonment fears activate big time. She's tremendously anxious because they might develop a loving bond with him and then they're going to abandon her. So she gets really, really anxious every time the kids are, are separated from her. But she doesn't know where that anxiety is coming from. She just knows every time they're with their dad, I'm really anxious. Now, if she has a sex abuse trauma history in her own background, she begins to think dad is abusive of them. There's some sort of threat from dad. Dad's, dad's a problem. And, and so she starts to develop these, these false beliefs that the children are somehow in danger from dad. And so you get a lot of these allegations into CPS and things of, of child abuse. And CPS looks at it and says, there's no child abuse here. But she continually maintains this, this um, high anxiety state with this. So on the next page, we can look at the family systems kind of thing. Third picture down here, we have Salvador Mnuchin. Uh, one of the, he just passed away recently, a week, week or so ago. One of the top, top people in family systems. 1993, he drew a diagram of what this family structure looks like. The cross-generational coalition, in this case the father and son have formed a coalition against the mother. And you can see the child is above the mother. The child is, is empowered by this coalition to judge the adequacy of the mother. And so it's called an inverted hierarchy. So now the child is judging the parent. That's weird. It's parents judge children. Are your, is your behavior appropriate, inappropriate? And then we deliver punishments or rewards based on our judgment of children's behavior. Here we have the whole world switched on its head. The child is judging the parent and delivering punishments to the parent as to what, because the child is being empowered by the narcissistic or borderline parent. And then the second diagram there is that can result in that cutoff family structure, where the mother is now cut off from the, from the kids. The way this is accomplished, final quote there about psychological control. Psychological control is an established psychological construct in professional psychology. That Barber quote down at the very bottom, I want you to note who published that book, the American Psychological Association. Then, so we know there's psychological control of the children and how it occurs. The way um, the narcissistic borderline parent gets the child to reject the other parent isn't by bad mouthing the other parent. A lot of people think it's by criticizing. No, 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 that's not how it happens. How it happens is get the child to believe that they're being victimized by the other parent. So let's say the child goes off and, and spends a visitation period with their mom, comes back to the narcissistic dad, and the dad starts questioning the child. How are things at your mom's house? Fine, everything is good. Really, you guys didn't get into a fight? No, no, no fight. Really no arguments about anything? Now, if the child doesn't criticize the other parent, then the narcissistic dad's going to stay on it, stay on and if she doesn't do it, He's going to get cold. He's going to get rejecting. He's going, to, he's going to communicate to the child, you didn't do the right thing. You didn't give me a criticism of the other parent. The moment the child, and the child realizes that, the child knows what the dad's wanting. They're wanting a criticism of mom. Well, it was kind of boring over at mom's house. That's all it takes. It's just a little criticism. The dad is then going to inflame that and say, oh my God, I, don't, I can't believe she doesn't have things planned for you. She's so selfish. She only thinks of herself. She never considers what anybody else wants. Now, it looks to, all, to the child and to all the world as if it's the child criticizing the parent and that parent's just being supportive of the child. No, it's incredibly manipulative. 
narcissistic and borderline personalities are the best at manipulation. You get the criticism out of the child, then you come in and support it, and you look like the nurturing parent and the criticisms coming from the child, and all the nasty stuff that you're doing is hidden underneath the child. Notice what I said in that. Oh my gosh, you know, she's so uh, you know, self-centered. Uh, she never considers what anybody else... He's criticizing the other mom. He's giving the child a framework for de denigrating the, the mother. But it doesn't look like it. Because it's the child who said it was born. And he's just being understand. And you do that for a couple months, year. That child knows the story. That child knows the routine. They come back from a visit with mom's house. Dad says, how are things at mom? Oh, she was so selfish. She didn't listen to me. She didn't gives the dad what he wants and then the dad starts to go and so the the way that the father or the way that the mother the borderline mother creates the rejection of the other parent is by getting the child to believe they're being victimized by normal range parenting now i want to explain a little bit where that comes from and that's that next page on the handout with the blue diagrams down here now that's aaron beck at the top aaron beck again is one of the top top people in professional psychology. And he talks about schemas in our attachment networks. Our attachment system forms patterns of relationships, expectations. What do I expect from myself and from the other in, in relationship? And then we use these patterns, these schemas, to guide our interpersonal relationships throughout our lifespan. What happens for the narcissistic or borderline parent is they had childhood trauma of their own. That's what created their narcissistic and borderline parent, is that they came out of child trauma, psychological or physical, potentially sexual abuse of them as a child that created their narcissistic and borderline personality pathology. And in their attachment networks are these patterns. John Bowlby calls them internal working models. Beck calls them schema. Freud called it the transference. We know that what this was happening. We have these patterns in the brain. Now, when the divorce takes place, those patterns reactivate again. And the pattern in the narcissistic brain is very specific. It's um, abusive parent, victimized child, protective parent. We have that schema pattern, that trauma pattern in the, in the internal working models of the narcissistic borderline parent. Abusive parent, victimized child, protective parent. In addition, the brain is also activating three networks for the current child, the other parent, and me as a parent. And it's the activation of two sets of brain networks, one from the past, abusive parent, victimized child, protective parent, one from the current situation, the other parent, the child, and me. And when we activate those two sets of brain networks at the same time, they become fused, they become equivalent. So we actually have this parent believing that the other parent is an abusive parent, this child is being victimized, and I get, I'm the protective parent. It's called a trauma reenactment. They are reenacting their own childhood trauma in the current situation. The issue is, none of that narrative is true. The child is not being victimized, the other parent isn't abusive, and you're not a protective parent. It's all a false drama, it's all a false narrative, a kabuki theater that is created, and the moment they get the child to believe they're being victimized, that automatically defines the other parent as abusive. You can't have a victimized child unless you have an abusive parent. I don't care what that parent has done or what the parenting, they've automatically been defined as the abusive parent and then it allows the narcissistic parent to, or borderline parent to come in and be the protective parent. I'm protecting the child from the abusive parent and the child says, yes, I'm being abused. The child comes in my office and says, my dad abuses me. I say, well, what's he do? He says, he took my iPhone away. Well, that's not abuse. Why do you take your iPhone away? Well, because I was mouthing off and wouldn't do what he said. That's called discipline. That's not called abuse. But you can hear that, how it forms when the child goes back to their mom and says, Dad took my iPhone away. Oh, I can't believe that. He's so insensitive to you. And, I, and she creates this false belief in the child that the child's being victimized. And so the child runs out to the therapists and lawyers and the judge and says, yes, I'm being abused. If you don't explore that to the next level, what do you mean being abused? Took my iPhone away. If you just buy the abuse, oh, yeah, okay. 
uh, you know, dad's being a problem. Dad's uh, too insensitive to the child's feelings or whatever. And, and people start to believe the false narrative that's being created. Now, is there authentic child abuse? Absolutely. I worked in the foster care system. When I was working early childhood, I worked with kids in the foster care system. <laughs> Electrical cords, sexual abuse. There's absolutely child abuse out there. The way I explain it is dogs exist. Psycho uh, child abuse exists. Cats exist. The narcissistic borderline personality pathology of a parent exists. The existence of dogs does not nullify the existence of cats, nor does the existence of cats nullify the existence of dogs. Both of them exist. Now the issue is both dogs and cats have fur, four legs, and a tail. So how do we tell them apart? Well, cats, cats have retractable claws. Dogs don't. Cats go meow. Dogs bark. And we can actually look at their DNA and tell them apart. So if you know where to look, you can tell them apart. And that becomes the important thing for the solution, is to understand where this pathology comes from and what it is. Cross-generational coalition, you'll see the inverted hierarchy. Trauma reenactment, you'll see the, the belief, the false belief in the child that they're being victimized when they're not. Um, the attachment-related pathology in a child that is extraordinarily unusual, extraordinarily rare. If you know where to look, you can identify the difference between a dog and a cat. But right now, we don't have the professional expertise out there to do that. This type of pathology involves the attachment system, personality disorder pathology, family systems pathology, and complex trauma. We need expertise in those four domains from our mental health professionals. And right now, we don't have it. There's not a mental health professional working with this type of pathology who has the necessary level of expertise. Essentially, what I describe to people is we currently have plumbers and electricians doing open heart surgery, and all the patients are dying. And we, they may be wonderful plumbers, they may be wonderful electricians, but they are not cardiac surgeons. We need the top level of expertise out there to deal with this very complicated, very severe form of attachment-related family pathology. The, um, in mental health's interface with the court system, I don't have a, I don't blame the court system. A lot of people say, oh, it's a problem in the court system. This is not the court system's problem to, to, to diagnose psychopathology. That's us, that's psychology. If we don't come with the professional expertise necessary for the court system to act, then the court system doesn't get the proper guidance and they don't know what to do on this. So that frames up the core of the solution. Uh, skipping a couple pages here into the diagnostic indicators up here. So my book, Foundations. What I did in Foundations, and the reason it's called Foundations, is I wrote and described what this pathology is in great detail and comprehensively, using only standard and established constructs and principles. Every time I refer to the word parental alienation, I always put it in quotes. Because I don't, as a clinical psychologist, parental alienation doesn't exist. Personality pathology exists, attachment pathology exists, complex trauma exists, cross-generational coalition. I know what all of that stuff is. Parental alienation is a popular culture term that you, and I don't care, everybody else can use that phrase to kind of capture the complex nature of the pathology, the legal system, and, and people in the general population. For us as clinical psychologists, though, we need to stop using that word and go back to standard and established stuff. And, and so I, in the foundations, I lay out what the pathology is, describe it in detail, leading to a set of three diagnostic indicators, those retractable claws, that will always show up with this particular type of pathology, cross-generational coalition with a narcissistic borderline parent, and will show up in no other pathology. 
No other pathology in all of mental health will produce this set of three symptoms. The first one is attachment system suppression uh, toward a normal range parent. The child is rejecting a normal range parent. It's really weird. Now we're in attachment pathology and that says there's pathogenic parenting somewhere. Second system, symptom is a set of five narcissistic personality traits in the child's symptom display. The child is showing five specific narcissistic symptoms. Grandiose judging of the parent, a sense of entitlement, the parent's supposed to meet my needs, an absence of empathy for the parent, haughty and arrogant attitude towards the parent, and a splitting, a demonization of the parent. I call these the psychological fingerprints of control on the child by a narcissistic parent. We cannot control a child without leaving fingerprints of that control. And so that second symptom are the fingerprints. How does a child acquire narcissistic personality traits? Is that child narcissistic? No. It's because the parent is narcissistic influencing the child and it's the child is picking up the attitudes of this parent towards the other parent, the absence of empathy towards the other spouse, the haughty and arrogant attitude towards the other spouse. So that's the second symptom. Third symptom is that victimization symptom, that trauma reenactment, false one. That the child has a fixed and false belief that they are being victimized by the normal range parenting of the targeted parent that it's abusive, I'm being victimized because my dad took my iPhone away. And it's a fixed and false belief. In psychology, a fixed and false belief is a delusion. And the belief that you are being victimized is a persecutory delusion. That it affects only one area of the child's life is called an encapsulated persecutory delusion. The child is showing an encapsulated persecutory delusion. Where is that child getting that from? the narcissistic borderline parent who believes this false narrative of victimized child. And so the child is acquiring this encapsulated persecutory delusion from the other parent. So we are essentially lifting the fingerprints of the patho pathogenic parenting from off of the child's symptom display. No other pathology, even authentic child abuse, will not show this set of symptoms. Child doesn't have a haughty and arrogant attitude towards their abuser. They don't have a sense of entitlement towards their abuser. No, authentic child abuse doesn't show these sets of symptoms. So we have three symptoms, we'll always define it. When you have a child who is this pathogenic parenting, pathopathology, genic, genesis creation. So a parent who is creating pathology in the child, they are creating developmental pathology, suppression of normal range attachment, bonding motivations where the child's losing a parent. Narcissistic personality traits, they are creating a personality disorder in their child. And a psychiatric delusion in the child when you have a parent creating that level of pathology in the child, the DSM-5 diagnosis for that is V995.51 child psychological abuse. And so right now in my practice, if I get this, that's the diagnosis, child psychological abuse. That's what I'm advocating that all mental health professionals start to use, child psychological abuse, and, and to assess along these lines. I have little booklets that describe the assessment process and how you assess for retractable claws and, and uh, whether it goes meow or bark. It's essentially about a six session assessment. Two se one session each with each of the parents, you begin to develop the symptoms. A session with the targeted parent and the child where you get to see it displayed before you. And then a session with each of the parents again to check their schemas and their patterns based on all of that. In about six sessions you can say, seven, eight if it's really complicated, you can tell whether or not it's a cat or a dog. Because it's very focused, I'm just looking at is this pathogenic parenting by a narcissistic borderline parent. So um, I try to keep out these other booklets brief so that they don't have to, to uh, so that they're accessible. Foundations is the one that describes all the information. Um, in order to solve this pathology though, we need the professional expertise in the attachment system complex trauma, family systems, and personality disorder pathology that we currently don't have out there. Now, when I go back to California, uh, 
this weekend, starting Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, I'm doing certification um, seminars. So I have about 10 people right now um, that I'm going to be training in this across two days and certifying them and saying you have the professional knowledge in not only the foundations of what the pathology is, but also in the ability to do the, the assessment. And this is also another intervention called a contingent visitation schedule where we can maybe uh, get a handle on this by when the child becomes more symptomatic, we reduce the time with the narcissistic borderline parent. When the child's symptoms go away, then we go back to 50-50 custody. So we're monitoring the child's symptoms. And if this parent starts to create symptoms, we're going to reduce the time with this parent, increase the time with the other parent to fix everything, and then it goes back to, and so it's a data-driven decision-making off of this. And this is what I would recommend a lot of the court systems begin to start to use when, when this is diagnosed. When, so I'm going to be training up some ABPA, attachment-based parental alienation certified mental health professions. But that's a slow process. Uh, that's not going to give the mental, the uh, court systems the necessary level uh, of professional competence um, generally. So I'm working with a, a nonprofit down in Houston, uh, Children for Tomorrow, Dwyane Lindsay, on developing or uh, implementing a pilot program for the family courts that in which I will come in to Houston and on a two-day seminar train up the mental health professionals and the seminar is in the morning is the foundations of the pathology afternoon is the diagnosis second day is assessment afternoon is treatment and so it boom 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 and get the necessary level of professional expertise to be able to use a standardized and structured assessment protocol to document the child's symptoms and we look at the targeted parent using a parenting practices rating scale, look at their parenting, look at this parenting, come up with a diagnosis and give a brief oh, six to ten page report to the court saying this is what we're looking at, this is what needs to happen. And you can do that in six to eight weeks uh, with the assessment and so it's a relatively quick uh, process for the court system. Then if, let's see, the, um, yeah, and so I'll describe it on this point in your handout. So when the court runs into any case of attachment related pathology surrounding divorce, I'm not using the word parental alienation. When the court runs into attachment related pathology surrounding divorce, they're going to refer the child or the family to an ABPA certified person who's going to do a structured and standard assessment and decide and come back to the court and saying, yeah, we're looking at ABPA. We're looking at this narcissistic borderline pathology here. If that's the case, then the court is going to take a new ABPA certified therapist and team them with an amicus attorney. And the amicus attorney, that's my third day of seminar for the pilot program, is I'm going to train up the amicus attorneys on what the pathology is and how to work with the therapist. So now we have the legal and mental health expertise necessary to solve the pathology. And it's going to, the court's going to team up the, that team and insert them into the family, and the fa they're going to stay there for probably five or six years to stabilize the level of pathology in this family to make sure that little girl has both parents and the love of both parents. We don't have a choice. We're going to fix this family. We're going to make sure this family makes a successful transition to a healthy family structure. The legal system, because of its adversarial nature, fosters conflict. And so everybody's running to their, their attorney and, and going into conflict. By putting an amicus attorney in the middle, we remove the conflict. The amicus attorney is working with the therapist. Now, they can, you know, the, the mom wants the child to take dance lessons, dad wants the child in soccer. Take it to your therapist. Don't litigate it. Therapist listens to everything and can help the family conflict through conflict resolution, communication. And the therapist ultimately listens to everybody and says, you know what, we're going to go with um, the dance lessons. And we're going to do dance lessons for a couple years, and then we're going to do... Uh, 
you know, the soccer lessons. You guys can't come together on that. Now, if one of the parents wants to take it to litigation, they can. They can take it to litigation and go before a judge. The judge is going to listen to your attorney, your attorney, and the amicus attorney. Amicus attorney is going to talk to the therapist. Amicus attorney is going to explain what's going on. The judge is hopefully going to support the, the therapist and thereby empower the therapist to solve stuff. Don't bring it into the legal system. Don't bring it into the court system. Figure it out with your therapist. Work it out. This is a family therapy issue. This is not a legal issue. This is not a child custody issue. And in that process, we can provide the court with the necessary level of professional expertise needed to solve this, and the therapist can um, take charge of the family's resolution into a healthy separated family structure. So, um, see here. in closing, I just want to look at the, the final page there. That, we, that in that picture from a documentary uh, called Erasing Families, all of those parent-child relationships are vital to children's healthy development. None of them are expendable. We need to make sure that children have a healthy post-divorce separated family structure in all cases. And that little girl there, I absolutely know what's in the best interest of that child. That is in the best interest of the child. I don't need a twenty to $40,000 custody evaluation to tell me that's in the best interest of this child. And so for me and my work, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to get us back onto standard and established constructs and principles. And once we do, we can absolutely solve this pathology. So again, I want to thank uh, the committee for giving me this opportunity to um, share my expertise and share my knowledge. Doctor, thank you. And we just have a couple minutes for questions. Questions? I knew uh, mm -hmm. Representative Brown, you, Lowry Brown, you had a question. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Ch Childress, get out my get out my house, okay? <laughs> get out my house. But um, no, seriously, I want to say thank you so much because your work is invaluable. Um, I don't think coming into this room this morning, I thought my thought pattern is where it is right now. So I just want to say thank you for enlightening me, um, helping me to understand what I see in my community far too often, what I've seen in my own life manifest. Mm. And, and for me, it's all about the children. And, and this is terrible for the children. Absolutely. And, and for the victimized parent on the other side as well. But the children in particular become adults who are stuck with these patterns that you're talking about, that are, are stuck with these uh, new ways of acting out, mm -hmm. and, and then become a parent. And can, I, can I say yes, something Yes, how do they get out of that cycle? The, when, one of the important things to teach children is that we have problems with other people. But when we have problems with other people, we don't discard them. We fix them. And so if the child has a problem with a parent, we fix that. Because when you have a problem with your spouse, what do you do? You do no, you fix it. And so it's an important lesson, it's an important skill set for children to have, uh, how to fix relationships when they go bad. Right, so, uh, and I appreciate that. The other thing I wanted to just point out is that how, in, in the situations where there's domestic violence, I believe that they're more primed to have a narcissistic um, parent, and and that that how do we as a society not see that starting to become the next step to the separation and divorce, and how do we protect that family? We're looking at child abuse, either physical abuse, violence abuse, domestic violence, that, or psychological abuse, but it's coming from a narcissistic parent, one side or the other. So I know I have a narcissistic parent somewhere, and that's the issue that mental health professionals need to step up and recognize. Um, and one of the, the central features, uh, I forgot to mention this, but about not only the, the, um, the pilot program, but the child abuse reporting laws. Um, I noticed in the Pennsylvania legislature, child abuse reporting laws refer to mental abuse, but don't define it. And, and that would be my recommendation, it's in the, the handout there, is a, a minor adjustment to the definition of child abuse that would 
be warranted by the DSM diagnosis of child psychological abuse, where we simply define child psychological abuse as creating pathology in the child. The Pennsylvania law talks about medical problems. They don't talk about inducing psychological disorders in the child through pathogenic parenting. And as diagnosed by a mental health professional, I would probably add that phrase just so we keep it uh, in a professional level. But um, you know, revisiting that child abuse reporting loss would send a clear message to all mental health professionals that they need to up their game, that they need to be looking for this child psychological abuse in addition to just physical abuse and things. Domestic violence is a, is a narcissistic parent. Physical abuse, narcissistic parent. Sexual abuse, narcissistic parent. This type of pathology, narcissistic parent. It's all the same. So as a lawmaker, how do we, if we already know that in a, in a situation where there's domestic violence, that most likely there is a narcissistic, mm -hmm. or probably about right. a 90 to 99 percent there is, right? So if that family going into the court system should be flagged immediately. You will, the moment you got attachment pathology, so if you have a child who doesn't want to be with a parent because that parent's violent and a domestic violence issue and that child's hesitant to be with that parent, this mental health professional is going to look at that. They're not going to see a child having haughty and arrogant attitude towards that parent. They're not going to see the signs of the attachment-based parental alienation. Instead, they're going to use a parenting practices rating scale and say, oh wow, you're a violent, aggressive parent. And you're a, this is a problem uh, we have over here. And so you're going to come out with a different treatment recommendation out of this for the uh, domestic violence as the other. And so that's a critical issue, is, is you get a competent, capable expertise that knows domestic violence and knows the difference between the two. So Dr. Childress, who do you suggest would pay for that? Because um, I experienced that in my own life, right? So I went into the court system as an abused parent and, and the court system never really gave value to the abuse and didn't really want to look at it and kept treating us as if we were uh, having an argument and just in a little bit of conflict. And therefore that never was really dealt with when it came to custody, child support. They said, we don't want to deal with that. That's a separate issue, separate court. Take your PFA over there. But in a custody hearing, we're going to just deal with this as if you're just having an argument, which the child, my, my child, and I'm just going to use myself as an example. That's why I, I mm -hmm. became a lawmaker. So um, the child paid the price. Mm -hmm. So how do we as lawmakers keep that from happening from other parents that are in domestic violence uh, situations? The mental health report to the court needs to be clear as to what the child protection needs are. And so it's not, I would say it's an inappropriate burden to put into the court system to determine um, psychopathology in the family. Um, so you get the mental health assessment of the ch child and of, of the family. So one of the issues about domestic violence, let's say, and I consider this version with the narcissistic parent, I'm going to kill your child, to be a version of domestic violence. And so it is, this is in the scope of that in many ways, uh, using the child as a weapon rather than, than hitting the mother. Um, at the same time, there with the borderline moms, you can get um, where the mom is, and dad are having an argument, let's say dad's in the bedroom, mom's in the hallway. Dad's like fed up and he's just so frustrated with this mom just saying he's crazy and he says, I'm out of here and he pushes past her and he pushes, kind of pushes her out of the way so he can go down the hallway and get out of the house. The borderline mom says, oh yeah, there's been domestic violence in my house. And I say, what? And she describes that to me. And I say, he pushed you, did he ever hit you? Did he ever, no. Did any other case? No. Did any other case? No. And so it's a, it's a dog and a cat thing. Mm -hmm. And this is something, do we really want that in a trial for you know, tens, twenty, forty thousand $40,000 trying to prove this in the trial? We need to bring it into the mental health office with expertise. And that's the critical issue. Right now we have electricians and plumbers. We need the top-notch people working with our court system who know domestic violence, who know child abuse, know what it looks like, know complex trauma, and also know borderline and, and can determine whether this is a cat or a dog. 
and then tell the court, we got a dog here. We got domestic violence. This kid needs to be protected. I'm worried about this. This is what needs to happen in terms of the child's treatment needs, not custody. Right. The child will still love that dad. The child will still benefit from a relationship with it. I just don't want to put the kid at risk. Mm -hmm. So I got to make sure that dad's safe. I see there's, there's other folks that have questions, so I'm going to wrap it up with Rep this. I'm also yeah, representative because I've got okay. four more people I'm and I'm way over. Okay. okay. All right. Could I fin finish or right. I'm done? Just finish okay. up, please. I'm also Thank on the health committee, and and what comes to mind to me is health care reimbursement for the mental health piece. Have you had any experience with that? And I conclude there. Thank you, Madam Chair. They're not going. Um, the the insurance companies won't pay for this. No, because the V code, child abuse is a V code. It's not a main code. Um, would I like it? Yeah, but it, this is a whole lot less expensive than a forty thousand dollar child custody vow. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have, and this will probably be all, ladies and gentlemen, just because I'm sitting here looking at the clock, uh, but Representative Conklin to be followed by Representative Stevens, Representative Mal, who may not be able to answer, ask all the questions he has on his sheet. Um, my close friend, but I do know him. And Representative Delicio, you'll do cleanup. And if you could keep it brief, people, I know there's, we could keep this poor gentleman until, I don't know, California falls into the Pacific, but we can't do that. Uh, so we'll try to be brief. And then certainly you can send questions. He gave us his email, so that would be helpful. Thank you. Chairman Conklin, yes, sir. I want to thank my co-chair for uh, keeping us on track. Doctor, just to let you know, in the political world, if you travel 50 miles or more, you're an expert. So you've definitely made it within the expert range today. I want to thank you for coming. One of the things that interests me both because of my past history, having to oversee the county that Pennsylvania is unique in its structure, the way our judicial system set up compared to other states as well. Do you have a template? Because within Pennsylvania, most of these cases are going to be seen at the county level, starting with the district justice, district magistrate, to the, to the county judge. Is there a template that you've come up with or something that you've come up with to, for institutions to look at ways that they could get involved with this, that they can design a system without reinventing the wheel, but something that they could look at that you have that I could pass along to many of these counties to show them what they can do to help out? Yes. Um, and so if the pilot program, and I'll leave this today, um, I have copies of this one, which is the assessment protocol. In the back of the assessment protocol, I, I give the instruments to be used. I also give samples of reports that would go from the mental health professional to the courts. Um, and then the contingent visitation schedule, I describe how that's structured and how that's implemented um, for that mental health professionals can use. And so um, I'm trying to, and I also have YouTube videos up that talk to the mental health professionals, um, conversations with Dr. Childress, so I talk about exactly how to diagnose the pathology. And so there, I'm trying to offer as many possible resources out there as well. I've also offered to do consultations with mental health professionals. All they have to do is email me and I'll do a Skype consultation on the assessment diagnosis of this pathology. Fundamentally, this is a mental health issue. And so it's within psychology to solve it. And then we can give clear direction to the court system on how to, on what needs to happen for the treatment, for the child's best interest kind of situation. And once the court can rely on professional expertise, then it's, it removes a lot of the burden from the court system on, on how to solve this. Thank you. Yeah, the reason I ask, because you know most of these cases go to court, and I was looking for some template to give to the local judges that they can divert this then to the county's mental health, mental retardation, and, and the rest of the resources they have to, as you say, work out a solution before it gets to that. So mm -hmm. I thank you so much. And my staff will be tackling you or your staff to, to get that information before you leave today. Thank right, you. Thank you. Thank you. And next then, uh, Representative Stevens. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I w sure. certainly uh, found a lot of benefit from, from your testimony. Do you have a, a timeline on this pilot program in Houston, and will there be some type of a report or um, you know, so, some type of conclu conclusory 
yeah. product that uh, we might be able to look to uh, in terms of the results yes. there? So um, I was invited down there October 20th, and I presented to uh, some attorneys and therapists down there um, and some legal professionals down there October 20th on this solution. Um, I'll, one of the people that's being trained this weekend is from Houston, uh, and so she will serve as part of the point person there. And Dwileen and the Children for Tomorrow will be the umbrella organization. Right now, she's looking for funding to get it up. Uh, she's also talking with Wesley in uh, Texas University to uh, serve as an additional research component on this. Um, there, I have in the back of the pilot program, I have the um, instrumentation instruments, so we will be collecting data throughout, so it's data driven. There will be documentation uh, integrated into the very uh, structure of the program. Since coming back from Houston, I'm preparing for this talk and for my training sessions, um, I'm getting emails from Dwileen saying there's a lot of interest down there. We're probably looking to get it up uh, hopefully after the first of the year uh, to get this, this program up and then we will have data here. Um, one of the reasons I produce this booklet is for other jurisdictions to be able to replicate something that's structured and standardized across uh, jurisdictions. So um, just a brief follow-up on, uh, on Representative Conklin's question. So if there were individual jurisdictions here that were interested in um, having you discuss your program with them, uh, that's something you'd be available yes. to do. And what, what essentially it would be, I would need an umbrella organization here to manage the program. Then I'd become brought in as a contractor to train up the expertise in three seminars, three days of seminars, and then would pay a little bit of attention here and serve as a consultant, but then they would manage the implementation of the, the program. Got it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Representative. Representative Mao. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Childress. I, I believe every word you said. Every single word I believe. <laughs> um, the, looking at it from a different angle, though, isn't this behavior always recognized after the damage has started or the damage is done. So wouldn't this be a reactive situation as opposed to a proactive? And if you say, no, it can be proactive, would we be asking our judges and masters, our divorce masters, to act as therapists to figure out who's, what family is going to have a problem and which family is not when it's really not their training nor their job? Currently, it probably takes about three, four, five years to diagnose and recognize the pathology. And by that time, it's well entrenched. And it's been through you know, five years of court custody and the, the failed therapies and all sorts of stuff. What I'm trying to activate here is a quick response. So the moment the, you see a court comes into court system with attachment-related pathology, let's get a quick assessment and start to monitor. Now there might be sub-threshold that we want to look at for a while, but the issue here is not parental alienation. It's pathogenic parenting. It's producing pathology in the child. As long as the child doesn't have psychopathology, I don't care how difficult that parent is. The child's doing okay. All right. But when the child starts to develop symptoms, I need to know, are these symptoms coming from the targeted parent or are they coming from this parent? And the moment the child starts to develop symptoms and I got the cross-generational coalition, then I need to step in and make sure the child stays calm. And so it's, it's a therapeutic issue that we can solve. Who's going to be reporting that? Who's going to be monitoring the child? The therapist. Because so, not all children in divorce situations go to therapists. But yet, a lot of them are abused, like you're saying, mentally yeah. through narcissistic parents. If it's coming parents. into the court system, the court has the option to say, you need therapy, you need a therapy with an ABPA certified mental health professional who knows what they're doing. And, and with narcissistic borderline, they're probably going to need therapeutic involvement for five, ten years because this parent is pathological. And so the issue becomes, if it's not in the court system, parents can do what they, okay, they live with that. But when it comes into the court system, the court needs a solution. And, and, and so the court's moving it into um, the therapy. Thank you very much. Sure. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair.
as always, and thank you for your brevity, sir. We are very close friends in case people go like, she says terrible stuff to him. No, no, it's the only one I can get away with saying terrible stuff to. Um, Representative Delisio. Thank you. Dr. Childress, um, you've helped make uh, an even stronger argument in Pennsylvania for the merit selection of judges, so thank you. <laughs> Piece of okay. legislation floating around. <laughs> Um, for your plug representative, you're, that you're was welcome. good. Very clever. Try to connect the dots however I can. Um, the certification you referenced, is that a state sanctioned certification? No, it's me. Okay, okay. I, and so I'm just saying, I'm saying this person has this necessary this background. training. Okay. So that, okay, that was one. And then the very quick others, uh, the reunification therapy, did I hear correctly in the beginning that there's no such thing but courts order it? Yep. And is there any data that, you know, where we could see the frequency of that? Or? Of court ordering that? No, uh, it's, it's the court uses the term as if there was something like that because I believe the court believes there is. Mental health professionals mm -hmm. use that word because it, they believe the court like recognizes it. And so everybody kind of uses a word, but there is no defined model theory ever in the, any of the literature any the, talks about what reunification therapy is. is. What and you want is family systems therapy. And then just very last, can the, the cut off family structure, can that be caused by a step parent? As it can be caused by a number of things. Yeah, it's it's a it's an outcome, not necessarily. But you get a cut off family structure tends to indicate unprocessed trauma in the family. There's trauma somewhere here that's not being dealt with, and and it's creating a breach in relationships that aren't fixed. Okay. That, thank you. Thank you, Madam sure. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Doctor, I can't thank you enough. I think it's amazingly, it's interesting. There is a part of me right away, and I said to my co-chair here, I said, wow, maybe we ought to work on training our sons and daughters before they get into a permanent relationship, because essentially, when I listen to you, all the problems that stem from that individual, and it's almost as if, and perhaps I'm overreacting, but it seems to me as if it's almost doomed, that you are doomed then to failure if indeed you end up falling in love with one of these narcissistic personalities. And that's frightening to me because in, unknowingly or whatever, y you condemn children to go through this. It just seems mm -hmm. very sad. And I will go home and tell my husband I love him dearly because we've been married for forever. And the kid seems pretty good. He's grown up now and he seems okay. So we're home free. Um, but I think there's more to be done. I would, again, go to my uh, counterpart here and say, we were talking about, we would like to see, and I know Representative Stevens mentioned, more of a training and a template uh, representative, yes, no matter how they are, um, they get there, but we want our judges to have kind of a unanimity of understanding. What I always say is so your zip, do, zip code doesn't determine the kind of services that you get. That what we hope in Pennsylvania is that we become enlightened, more enlightened, the point of this hearing, but at the same time that wherever you live, you feel that in this kind of a situation, you get fair treatment because it's understood what the treatment should be. So in some ways, and it seems to be, it all begins and ends with your association and uh, psychologists and psychiatrists understanding this so that they have unanimity to present to right. families and courts. Am uh, I correct at uh, least? Absolutely, that I agree with everything that you just said. I would Wow, add, that's unusual yeah. for me, sir. Thank yeah. you. And I, I would add that our goal is to protect 100% of children, 100% of the time, from all types of and child abuse. And that is abuse. the goal of this committee. Yeah. So, sir, on that note, I will say that this informational meeting is adjourned. I thank you all for being here. Thank you.